Hi, Simon. Hi, Bob. How are you doing? Pretty good. Good. Let me introduce us. I'm Robert Wright of Blogging Heads TV, and you are Simon Young, and you've been kind enough to join us uh, from Hong Kong, where you're a professor of law at the University of Hong Kong and director of the Center for Comparative and Public Law. And you are going to um, illuminate the Edward Snowden situation. Uh, Snowden, of course, has famously uh, disclosed some classified documents bearing on American surveillance. Shortly before doing that, he went to Hong Kong, where we assume he still is, right? Uh, um, and uh, you are an expert on the law, and that's going to figure uh, pretty pretty heavily in his fate, I guess, and, and politics may as well. We'll talk about both of those things. Um, let me let me just start uh, by asking you what, how much awareness there is in Hong Kong of this case. Is everyone talking about it? Are there sightings of Edward? Do people say, "I think I saw Edward Snowden"? Or any, you know, what's it like there? Well, of course, it's been about a week and a half now since the story uh, uh, was released, and yeah, people in Hong Kong are, are well aware. Um, and uh, you know they're well aware of the international media that's here that's covering Hong Kong. It's been on the front page for the past week or so. Um, I think even just I just started noticing today the reporting seems to be dying down a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, but there was of course the the huge demonstration on the weekend. That was really quite amazing. Tell us about uh, that. Oh yeah, the hundreds of people uh, coming out on the streets, rallying in, in favor of Mr. Snowden, and, and this, of course, came out right right after. This happened right after the revelation that uh, that the U.S. had been hacking into Hong Kong uh, servers and Chinese. That, that was Snowden's uh, revelation, right? That's right. That that's right. And that, that really, I think, uh, charged up the people here. Um, and you should, you should have seen the signs that people had. In fact, even if we go out today and you go to the, the, the main business district central, there are still signs that are still on the, uh, the, the, the side of the roads uh, in favor of, of Snowden, what, Free what Snowden. Things, uh, free Snowden, there's a Free Snowden yeah. movement. Free Snowden, you know, stop hacking uh, and, 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 you know, wanting more information, more accountability uh, from the U.S. Um, so it's really uh, char charged us up, and, and there were some preliminary surveys done saying that more than half the people, you know, would, would say that we shouldn't return him uh, if and when the request comes in. I mean, the surrender request from the U.S. government hasn't even come in yet, as far as we know. Um, but there's, he, he seems to have has done well in, in winning popular support here. Okay. Um, there's no doubt that this, that the request, the uh, it's commonly called an extradition request, but technically I guess it's a, it's actually a surrender request. That's right. For reasons having to do with Hong Kong's relationship to China, uh, yeah. Hong Kong, but because Hong Kong is not a, a sovereign state, but is, right. is a special administrative zone of China. Um, there's no doubt that that's going to happen, right? I mean, uh, the, the U.S. is going to press charges, and 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 this will come to a head. Now, um, he. Sounded as if he, he, he felt well positioned to withstand that. I mean, his quote was, uh, I've had many opportunities to flee Hong Kong, but I would rather stay and fight the United States government in the courts because I have faith in Hong Kong's rule of law. My intention is to ask the courts and people of Hong Kong to decide my fate. I've been given no reason to doubt your system. Does that sound like somebody who understands the situation he's in, or is he being too optimistic? Well, I think in terms of process rights, uh, he's absolutely correct. I mean, this is a due process society. We've got constitutional rights, freedom of expression, fair trial rights. So he who have no problems with getting uh, entitlements in terms of process. Um, whether he will ultimately return, I mean, that's another question. Um, it, there's very few cases where people have succeeded in challenging uh, extradition surrender requests. Um, but another thing I think he has to bear in mind, and, and perhaps I don't know if he's psychologically or mentally got uh, been prepared for this, is that he'll likely be in custody mm -hmm. while this fight goes on. It's very difficult to get bail. I mean, it's possible, oh, but really? you have to show you have to show special circumstances. So, so this is a very interesting case where you have both the uh, surrender and the asylum uh, elements combined. So in Hong Kong, you know, we have thousands of asylum seekers, mm -hmm. and, and, and for various reasons, they're sort of stuck here, 
uh, uh, because of procedural inadequacies, and, and I can go into that in a moment. But um, but they often are free. They they have um, bail. They have recognizance, and, and they can live in the community. And so that's why it's possible for them to to go on for years. Um, uh, although their their situations are very desperate, right? Mm -hmm. Government doesn't doesn't give them any support at all. Uh, so. Um, that's going to be contrast to someone like Snowden, where he's also facing the surrender request, but in custody. Mm -hmm. So yes, you can fight, um, and it may take years, but I mean, do you want to actually be in custody for years? So that'll be an important question that he'll have to consider uh, down the road. Yeah. So is the only way that uh, he could wind up being free in Hong Kong if if he is in fact granted asylum, and let, let's leave aside for now uh, the way that the Chinese government might eventually override a decision in Hong Kong, but is the yeah. only decision that could be made in Hong Kong that would make him a free man one to grant asylum? But look, there's two possibilities. Uh, one uh, is within the surrender process itself, you can um, uh, have the surrender prohibited if uh, you can show the political offense exception. That's standard sort of extradition law exception. If, um, if, 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 if they think he's being prosecuted for political reasons in the United that's, States. That's essentially in a nutshell, yes. Uh, and so that could then short circuit the surrender process. Um, and then he would then be uh, an illegal immigrant here. So he could be charged with immigration offenses and deported. Then he needs the asylum uh, process uh, to stay uh, here indefinitely or to, to be removed to a somewhere else uh, where he might be able to go. Uh, and so, yes, asylum, um, and, and asylum would have trumped the, the surrender proceedings as well. So that would be the, the ultimate issue. So ultimately, he, he needs asylum there. Um, the only other option being if he's granted, you know, if, if the U.S. isn't given the extradition at once, uh, the only other option being for him to go to some country where maybe he would have uh, better luck on the asylum front. Now, of course, one more consideration, of course, is that once he sort of is, I mean, once the surrender proceedings end in his favor, I mean, that's the beginning of regularizing his life here in Hong Kong. So, you know, we talk about asylum, but he could well find a job. Mm -hmm. he, he, like many expats who work in Hong Kong, I'm sure he, he won't have any difficulty. Uh, finding a, a, a job here, and you get a work visa, and then he could start the, the the clock ticking for his residency here in Hong Kong. So he could, so, in, I mean, he could in principle remain there without having, uh, with uncertain status, but yeah. live a comfortable life for for quite a while. Yeah, and then, but of course, travel to other countries will be dangerous. Yeah, well, you can't have everything, you know. Yeah. Um, so, uh, and and what is your your feeling about, uh, you know, the normal, I forget the exact language, but, but, the, but the question of whether his prosecution is thought to be for political issues, uh, if that's the main way, um, if that's his main uh, loophole here, what are, what are the chances that that will be the ruling in Hong Kong? Look, it, it's tough to give a, an opinion on that now for two reasons. One is we really don't know all, all the circumstances, and in fact, the circumstances unravel each day. Mm -hmm. I mean, things that uh, U.S. officials say is going to be relevant to this kind of uh, issue. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, and the more they sort of r rattle their swords, mm -hmm. uh, call him a, a traitor uh, and, and saying he's an enemy of the state, that sounds a lot more political. Uh, and, so, and, they've so, said, they think, and they've said things like this. They've yeah. used the word treason, right? Or is there somebody, yes. I mean, I guess I'm not clear on which exact politicians have done that. It would have to be people in the executive branch who have said these, yeah. I assume, for them to have much And maybe right. perhaps they could argue that's a bit more removed from the actual people handling the case. Mm -hmm. So prosecutors, investigators have to also be very careful about what they say. Um, but the other uncertainty, of course, is that this is an issue that, um, as far as I know, hasn't been litigated in the Hong Kong courts. Uh, so there are, uh, you know, elements of our surrender law that have not been interpreted. We don't know how it, they might be applied. Uh, so that's also an uncertainty. Sure, we can look to other countries because, um, you know, uh, surrender law is a kind of law that you can draw upon comparative experience from other jurisdictions, but it's still a bit unclear about how the Hong Kong court approached that. Do you mean there haven't been surrender cases so far? 
No, no, none that have raised the issue the of political, political offense issue. exception. There have been many surrender cases, uh -huh. uh, not too many that, that are litigated in the courts, but even of, of those that have been litigated, I don't think uh, the issue of political offense has arisen. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, now, uh, there is no doubt some suspicion in the United States that this will ultimately be a matter of politics more than of law. I think uh, a lot of people in the United States don't, and I count myself among them actually, don't clearly understand the relationship of Hong Kong to China as a practical matter. I mean, I know it's an administrative zone, and there are these, that, that, that uh, strictly speaking, there is um, autonomy in yeah. matters like this, unless China overrides the ultimate decision, um, which it can do under, under strict provisions. Um, but, you know, uh, some people no doubt suspect that uh, at the end of the day, Hong Kong's part of China. The Chinese regime will decide uh, what is in its political interest here, and that's what will happen. Is that an unfounded suspicion? Well, I, I don't like generalities, and, and I think, in fact, one of the uh, good things about this case is that it's an opportunity to sort of explain how the one country, two system model has worked and does work. Um, uh, in general, you know, we have fairly uh, strong safeguards as to the rule of law in Hong Kong. We've got an independent judiciary. Uh, we have a very interesting court system where we have, we have foreign judges who sit on our final court, uh, and they add an element of not only quality to wow. the judgment decision. That's really unusual. Make. Is there any yeah. other place in the world that has foreign? There are. I mean, it's it's not um, uh, foreign to common law systems, especially the smaller common law systems, uh, where there may not be the expertise locally. Uh, but we this was a system we chose to adopt after 1997, and it's been a it's a big boom to to our our, 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 our state of law. Um, and giving confidence to, to investors, uh, etc. Mm -hmm. um, so, in that sense, um, uh, there's there's many um, uh, things to say, positive things to say about our system of justice. However, um, there are moments when the the Chinese government can and, and has intervened, and the question is, is this going to be one of those moments? Um, because, of course, in our constitutional framework. It is said that China has jurisdiction over matters of foreign affairs mm -hmm. and defense, as you would expect. Mm -hmm. And the question is, to what extent is this case going to engage those interests enough that China would intervene? But even if you they intervene, they just can't do it willy-nilly. You have to do it according to how, how the law has, has structured such intervention. And here you have to look at our surrender law, because there's actually a provision that deals with instances where the PRC can intervene, um, it says, firstly, that our chief executive has to notify the central government about extradition proceedings. Mm -hmm. And secondly, it says that if the matter is going to significantly affect, I emphasize those words, significantly affect foreign affairs and defense of the central government, then they can give instructions to the chief executive. Mm -hmm. All right? They, they, they can't give instructions to the courts. The courts remain independent. Hmm. So what that means is that if the courts were to say uh, that he should not be surrendered, uh, that's the end of it. Mm -hmm. uh, because if you don't move to the second stage of decision-making involving the chief executive, right? it's only when you move to the second stage of decision-making, and if the chief executive on his own was to think either we should surrender, we shouldn't surrender, that's where China could interfere and say, well, you should follow our instructions. But it might never get to the chief executive. In other words, in theory, the courts could decide both not to grant surrender to the U.S. and to grant asylum. The courts could do both of those? That's in which, right. In that's which right. case, the Chinese government would not have the legal authority to override. That's right. That's, um, right. That, that, that's, that's due to our high degree of autonomy. Um, it's only where you have a question concerning the, the interpretation of our Constitution, the basic law, mm -hmm. that there are some decisions, uh, questions of law, that have to be referred to uh, uh, the, uh, a body in mainland China. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's when you have to interpret the, the Constitution, and I don't see any issues of, of that kind arising. So it seems likely, then, that this will 
be settled one way or another by the courts and not the chief executive. Uh, um, well, if, if the courts give the green light, then we got to go to the chief executive. If they uh, grant the surrender request. Yeah, if they're prepared to say that we can commit him uh, uh, to the custody of the chief executive for surrender purposes, and then we have to focus our attention on the chief executive. Okay, but but if they if they give Snowden if the courts give Snowden what he would like and what he needs to be free, it won't reach the level of the chief executive. That's and, right. And in that event, uh, Chinese government could not formally yeah. exert influence. Now there there is the the question about subterranean politics, but but you're what you're saying is, as a structural matter, leave aside whether whether the uh, the Chinese government could could have a conversation with the chief executive and you know get some business done quietly you're saying that just really doesn't matter the court as a structural matter the court system is autonomous for, for this issue yeah I would agree I mean we, there was a few years ago a couple years ago we had a, another case that was a bit more controversial not about not about surrender not about human rights mm -hmm. it was a case where Chinese interests uh, were directly uh, implicated, and, and they did intervene. This is a case about uh, whether you could sue a country in Hong Kong courts, whether you could sue an African country in Hong Kong courts, and then an African country uh, claims what is known as state immunity uh, from from uh, suit uh, mm -hmm. in the Hong Kong courts. And here China did get involved. They say, well, this is a matter that we should have the final say on. They got involved and they won, and then the courts sort of in a way uh, uh, admitted uh, the, the the Chinese interest and and, uh, and did refer a question to the Chinese body. Mm -hmm. In Snowden's case, if, if 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 the court's verdict was to surrender him and he was handed into the custody of the chief executive and 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 uh, the Chinese government wanted to intervene, I'm trying to imagine what the logic of the decision would be. It, 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 it has to be a case basically of national security, right? They have, to, they have to be able to say the national security interests of the Chinese government dictate that we keep him here. Yeah. And it's not that easy for me to imagine that case being plausibly made. It would be one thing if it were a Chinese citizen with knowledge of their surveillance system, right? Uh, uh, leaving the country. But it's much harder for me to imagine the case being plausibly made here. I think once we get to that uh, level of decision making, um, probably uh, more politics will enter. I mean, you can. It will probably be up to China to really define what they mean by foreign affairs, and and there, um, you know, there, there are many elements that could come into it. Um, and and I think one element that um, we have to bear in mind is um, how, uh, China's. Uh, um, uh, 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 relationship with Hong Kong, mm -hmm. and, and 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 how important China sees that uh, in maintaining that relationship, because you you have to now situate this issue in the broader political context of Hong Kong. What's going on right now? You know, we're coming up to July first, and that's the day of of major protests in our city. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll see thousands of people going on the street. You know, and for whatever various why reasons. Why is that? Does that happen every year? It happens every year. It started in, in 2003. You know, just the, the, the culmination of public um, anger, uh, unhappiness with the Hong Kong government, with concerns of China increasingly trying to interfere in our political system. Uh, and so it's that uh, tension that I don't think China would want to make worse. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And so that, I think, is a very important element in, in these kinds of decisions. Is it really worth this one man uh, to uh, uh, to try to intervene here? Although it sounds like if the courts were prepared to turn him over and China intervened to stop that, China would have the support of a lot of people in Hong Kong, right? That's true, but again, at the same time... Um, Intervention they, itself is a touchy issue. But, but at the same time, you know, it, having passed the level of the courts, in a way... Uh, China is a bit insul is a bit sort of sort of, sort of has um, uh, is insulated uh, from scrutiny, saying you know they can say well the court said that it's fine, we're just going to respect that decision, uh, mm -hmm. and we see no other reason not to. Mm -hmm. um, and in a way that that's also then you know would uh, help them in terms of their foreign relations with the U.S. as well, 
Um, so that is also, I think, probably the more, more likely outcome. And by the way, um, there are sometimes in the U.S. judges are thought to be responsive to popular sentiment. Sometimes just because that's kind of the way people are, but sometimes because uh, they are actually elected and it will be up for re-election in some places. What is the degree of sensitivity of the Hong Kong courts to grassroots opinion in Hong Kong? Yeah, look, we don't we don't have elected judges mm -hmm. here, so you don't have that kind of direct um, uh, influence. Uh, I mean, people talk about this. Uh, academics talk about it. We speculate. We, we often identify certain decisions which we say, you know, our judges uh, had basically conformed to the public opinion. Mm -hmm. um, but, but on the whole, judges, of course, they know they themselves uh, 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 re rebuff any notion of uh, surrendering to public opinion, and you have enough diversity of views in the judiciary where you see judgments, uh, you know, being decided in one way in the lower courts and then being reversed in the higher courts. So there's enough of that going on that that you can feel assured that there's independence uh, in in our system. You know, all told, it sounds to me like Snowden kind of knew what he was doing. I mean, when, when he first just said he was going to Hong Kong, you, you you know, you have these people saying he doesn't understand the actual situation with blah, blah, blah in Hong Kong. He should have gone to Iceland. Um, sounds to me like he had this thing pretty well sussed out, and then he only helped his case, if anything, with the disclosures about American uh, hacking of Chinese and Hong Kong computers. Yeah, that, I, that I, right? I agree with that. I mean, one also has to understand what is it that he wanted to achieve. And it seems like Hong Kong was fit for his purpose. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's what one has to understand. I mean, if his, if his ultimate goal is, is to completely evade all, any form of justice, well, you know, maybe he could have gone to Bhutan, right? Mm -hmm. But, um, but he, that's not his end goal. And, and he wants to be in a safe, comfortable, interesting place where you can continue to inform the public about what's going on, um, and, it, and the system would give him enough time to do that. Um, ultimately, um, he may have to be sent back. He may decide to go back himself. He may feel that everything he's done has already been accomplished, that his American lawyers tell him that if you go back, you do a short jail sentence and you're free. That, that might well be you know a what? I don't think he's going to get a short jail sentence if he comes back to America. Well, <laughs> I, I, I don't, I don't, I don't think he's ever getting out of jail if he comes back to America. I'm not a legal expert, <laughs> but I'm telling you, the administration uh, is going to be playing hardball on this one. And, and, and I mean, kind of understandably. I mean, I yeah. personally uh, am, am am on his side in the sense that I think America had a right to know this stuff, and I admire him for disclosing it. On the other hand, if you're somebody running a government, you 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 need to establish the precedent that people who disclose documents like this don't wind up you know being being uh, happy about it you know i mean that's just the way any government is going to work i think well i mean i think the, the two responses to that one is i mean what harm has he actually caused i mean relative uh, relative to other whistleblowers i mean what you know what is right. the overall harm and and the benefit and one has to weigh that and then secondly um you know, I mean, is he entirely to blame himself? I mean, what safeguards could the government have taken, in, you know, in these contractual relationships have to prevent this? I mean, I don't think... No, that, that's all true. All I'm talking about is the incentive within the uh, executive branch to make an example of him for, for, for future yeah. whistleblowers and would-be whistleblowers of all kinds. I think that's going to be the imperative felt in the... That, that might be their motive, but you would hope that justice is, is more, more than that, and, and that's not what justice is about. Maybe I've gotten cynical in my old age, but uh, you, you certainly would hope that that's what uh, justice is about. Um, so the only downside then of Hong Kong is, as you said, uh, during an extradition request, it's, it can be hard to get bail, so he could wind up... Uh, doing some some real jail time yeah. during the judicial process. That's right, and, and conditions could be somewhat harsh. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, I mean, it, it would really just depend on whether he's psychologically prepared uh, for that. Okay. Final question. Um, you know, it is it is thought in the United States that the Chinese government conducts uh, surveillance of its citizens at least as extensive as anything he's disclosed 
uh, uh, you know, in a, the American government doing. Um, and I, I don't actually know to what extent the surveillance includes uh, citizens of Hong Kong, but has there been much discussion of this in kind of uh, appraising the merits of his case and, and, and how indignant people should be about what the American government is doing? Yeah, I think um, certainly it's opened our eyes and, and our legislators are asking questions already uh, of our government. Um, you know, how much did they know? Uh, what's, what further steps are, gonna, are they going to take uh, to prevent uh, uh, this kind of surveillance? Um, one issue that um, uh, uh, that they haven't started looking at, and, and I've been uh, uh, looking into it a bit, is to, to, what, to what extent are the uh, the U.S. activities in Hong Kong um, perhaps um, facilitated by disclosures that the Hong Kong government itself, and maybe even the Chinese government, has given to the Hong, to the U.S. government. Uh, and these are disclosures in the form of intelligence uh, pursuant to laws that uh, allow for sharing of uh, intelligence concerning terrorism. Mm -hmm. um, and so that may, in a way, has, has, uh, has effectively served to sort of to, to bite us back, uh, in a way, uh, in, in inviting this, this kind of surveillance. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. All right. Anything else you want to say about the case before we... Uh... Well, I could go. I could go on uh, for a long time, but I think we just really simply have to, to wait and see. Uh, every day is kind of a, a new story, um, and it seems like he is, uh, as you said, uh, staying put uh, in Hong Kong. Uh, the search continues for, for where where he is. No doubt, when the surrender request does come in, the authorities will need to arrest him, and then. And that'll be an interesting uh, new new page uh, to the story. But but for now, there's no police search because he's not subject to arrest. For, for the That's time. correct. But no doubt, I, I'm sure that uh, the, the authorities here are probably trying to keep tabs on him because when the request comes in, that that's the next step uh, is to mm -hmm. search him out and and to arrest him. And you have a sense for uh, you know once the U.S. makes the surrender request, how long it might take to get the first verdict on on that issue itself on surrender. Uh, it's hard to say. Um, I've looked at a few cases where individuals have actually consented to the surrender mm -hmm. and where they're not contesting anything. And that whole process from when the uh, request comes in and when the person actually leaves Hong Kong can take up to three to four months. Yeah. Uh, so even with consent, uh, it, there's, there's a bit of a delay. Um, if there's a court proceeding, it could be several months uh, before we get uh, to, the, uh, to the beginning of that court proceeding. Okay. All right. Well, thank you again, Simon, yeah, for taking the time. This has been very illuminating. Thanks. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye.